Welcome to the No Filter Highlight Reel, where we take fan favorite live streams to showcase your favorite content. No Filter Network is a premium live streaming platform for content creators that allows hosts to monetize their shows by creating an interactive experience with their audiences. In every No Filter stream, viewers have the option to use a live chat or a feature called Knock to join the live stream themselves. What you're watching now is a recording of a live show, including audience members interacting with the hosts in real time. If you want to view more video replays of this host's show or watch a live stream where you can be a part of the show yourself, then click the link in this episode's description or go to nofilter.net to browse our selections of upcoming live streams. You can also start hosting your own podcast on No Filter Network and easily schedule, market, and sell tickets to your own show and replays. Visit the website for more details. All right, it is my great pleasure to have someone I have known for a long time and watched with admiration as he has climbed the ladder. Uh, one, Mark Spears with ESPN's Undefeated. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for, for taking the time. Um, I, I, what I appreciate is that Mark agreed to do this, and I don't think he really knows what we're doing. He's it, just like... Uh, Dude, you I, ask I, me. I'm, I'm it's, slightly, it's just, slightly nervous, man, but I, I, I feel like I could trust you. I, I promise I'm not going to get you into trouble. I'm not going to. Because we both, both having worked for ESPN, we know, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get into talking yeah. about something in a casual way that is going yeah. to get you in trouble. I, I, I have I'm no more interest worried in about you. that door opening in the back, like, Look here, MF. Da, 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 da. I hate you. You know, like, oh, I'm sorry. Why you bring them out here, Rick? Uh, yeah, no, like, no, no. These no. are the people that are bad at you. Let's go. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, none of that. None of that whatsoever. Um, I more than anything, uh, I, I've I've put this together this or putting together this series for, uh, for no filter, which is really just, uh, and it's and it's. Uh, you know, it's instructive for me as well um, in that I'm just looking at at the sports journalism, sports media industry as we see it today. And you've been around as I have for a while. And to see how it's changed and to see what anybody who's interested in coming into it now, like what it consists of. And I was just I was thinking about my path and I was thinking about your path and yours is kind of somewhat similar, you know, going out yeah. there, interning with newspapers, being willing to go wherever that's going to allow you to get a byline and then kind of just slowly building your way and your and your tools, uh, utilizing your tools to become a, a, a sports writer and somebody who can cover sports. And so. I, I know you work with a, uh, and, and mentor uh, other young uh, writers and aspiring journalists, what what are you telling them when they come to you, as I'm sure they do, uh, as they have me, and say, how do I get to where you are? Like, what do you, what do you say to them, considering that that path may not necessarily be quite the same anymore? Yeah, I, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It, it's definitely, uh, I've always respected you, man, and, and saw you as, um, you know, you know, we don't say this stuff while we're competing against each other. They're like, because yeah. <laughs> Rick, Rick was Rick was that dude. I'm like, damn, Rick, when you gonna be done done talking to Kobe? Because I want to talk to Kobe too. <laughs> and me and him would be Rick and I would be like, uh, yeah, boxing each other out to talk. Side, to Kobe. side eye on each other across the room, yeah, like, like, yeah, like, 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 slip in here. All right, yeah. when, when is when is Kobe gonna be free? When is Steph gonna be free? Because uh, I know Rick gonna want to talk to him too, and and I, I know I'm, I'm I haven't answered the question yet, but I did want to tell you this, Rick. I always I, you said something to me that has always stuck with me. You probably don't even remember you said this. And you mentioned that our our, our careers have been kind of similar, and and I remember you were at the Merck covering the Warriors, and you ended up going to Washington to cover the Wizards, right? Yep. And and I was always very curious about that move because some might have thought that that was a sideways move, but at the time it wasn't because the, the Warriors were awful, and maybe other than Sprewell choking the coach, which I think you covered, um, there wasn't really much going on for you to 
to help advance your career because they weren't going to the playoffs. They weren't winning no games. Nobody was paying attention to what you were writing. Suddenly you go to Washington. Was Jordan on the team then? Did you get the Jordan years? No, 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 no. no. I, I was there when uh, C. Webb and Juwan Howard and, yeah. and, but you, and but that you, crew. That... You basically went to a, 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 the nation's capital, covered a more exciting team, and I think that ultimately led you go, to go to ESPN. So I say this to say, when I left the Denver Post to go to Boston in 2007, I had covered the Nuggets for eight years and tried to get this calmness job at the Denver Post. I don't know if you know this. I do. And they, I thought I was going to get it, and then Woody Page ended up coming back. And there's more to that story, but we don't need to get in there. Um, and so I was like, I got to go. And I had actually turned down an opportunity to cover the Heat like the interview for the heat job at the Miami Herald and I think I would have got it. And then I was just like, I got to make a change. So I ended up seeing Kevin Garnett go to Boston and had the interview set up. And I was like, I got to get this job. So I ended up getting a job, KG, Paul and Ray. And I talked to you and you're like, you told me, and this is, this is what I'll never forget. You said, essentially you're going to be doing the same job you did in Denver, but it's going to help your career because now people are actually going to be reading. And I was going to the Boston Globe. I was going to a big market. I went and covered a team that ultimately won a championship and that changed my career. And it wasn't that covering Mello wasn't cool or Iverson later in his career or Billups or Kenyon or Andre Miller wasn't, but they weren't, they weren't winning championships. They, they weren't getting past the first round of the playoffs. They were in a top 10 market and you were right. Like you were, you were immediately right because it was amazing to me when I went there. Like that, being in that market, suddenly people read me, and it was like Rick is right. I'm doing the same thing <laughs> endeavor, but now all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, my profile is bigger, and now Yahoo Sports is interested in me and coming to them, and uh, like like people are paying attention to my work, and I'm. Yeah, so it, it, it's in, I, I know I'm sideways off of your question, but I always every time I think of you, I think of you telling me that now how true you were. But to answer your question, journalism is so different now than me, when me and you came out of J school. Because <clears throat> I think and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but because you teach this now, but we didn't go to school to be TV guys radio people like we went i minored in psychology i took print journalism uh, when i graduated from san jose state to get my bachelor's so to me like doing radio was just running my mouth it's natural there's no real you know (laughs) magic to that but tv was different because when i started doing more and more of that i had to learn what camera to look into i had to learn how long i wanted my answer to be um I had to learn how to put makeup on. Like, I didn't know those things. If you're a journalist now, you, because we didn't, the internet was, was being born when we were like in college, right? Or early in your career in college, in, you know, college for me or early in my career. So it was different. There wasn't no Twitter. There wasn't no Instagram. There wasn't no. Right. So now these kids coming out, you got to know how to write. You got to know how to speak. You got to know how to promote yourself, uh, produce. Like you really need to learn everything. So I don't even know that you could minor in something that isn't journalism, I, I, like in the journalism field anymore. Like if I was a kid coming up now, I would, and I wanted to be a writer, I'd probably major in print journalism and minor in television, <laughs> like so I could learn all of it yeah. instead of just taking some general course. So oftentimes now, you know, when I get calls, texts from college students, emails, phone calls, one, they don't, they do everything, but they don't, like Rick, we, I always say going into NBA, if you want to be an NBA player, you got to do one thing great, right? You got to be able to be an amazing scorer, amazing rebounder, defender, something. You had, whatever is your strength, you, it can't be just a strength, you got to be great at it. 
And I think yeah. it's the same thing for a journalist. Like either you're a great writer, you're great on TV, you're a great producer. You have to, you could do uh, everything, but you have to be great at one of them. And that's what I tell the young journalists is you, whatever you're great at, like start with that. Get your yeah. foot in the door with that. But the problem is where what we did and a lot of them don't do is they don't get any experience. They don't get any ex internships. Like I applied for internships in the fall. They calling me in the spring about, hey man, can you help me get an internship with the undefeated? I'm like, um, you were supposed to apply in October. Like, why now you're in a panic because you don't have anything and, and you yeah. think you can just make a call and get an internship? No, nah, man, it don't work that way. Especially yeah. for the good ones and they don't realize like you like I used to apply for th to thirty places hoping to get one, and a lot of these kids like think that when well I'm amazing so they're gonna take me, right? No, or, you're competing against a hundred other people. Yeah, or it's they're only they're a little bit like the Clippers. There's this unearned arrogance of. Well, I, you know, I want to go to ESPN or Fox or Yahoo or whatever. I yeah. like I'm going to go there. You know, they're they're not going to go to the Tulsa World. They're not going to go to yeah. the dimming headlight in New Mexico. And then I was yeah. like you. I was like, I I just want to go someplace where I get a chance to do it. Like I get a yeah. chance to work. And you wanted to play. Yeah, I wanted to play. You to get I in the game. You didn't yeah, care what I, level it was. You just wanted to get in. Exactly. And my experience was, you know, and I, and I, I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it at a, at a big place too. And, and I couldn't get into a big, I had an internship with Sports Illustrated when I was in college. My yeah. thing was, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to go right back to SI and I'm going to be a writer and, and away we go. You know, I'm going to be the next Frank yeah. Ford. Yeah. And, uh, and that didn't happen. And I was doing, I was covering high schools in San Diego. Yeah. That was a real come down for me. Yeah. But what I, I learned all the tools of the job because I had to, I had to do everything myself. I had to keep my own stats. I had to get my own phone numbers. I had to like, I had to do everything myself on a very small platform. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And meanwhile, I saw people who did go straight from school or relatively from graduating <laughs> to SI or to ESPN or wherever. Yeah. And they eventually, like, they eventually fell out because yeah. once you separated them from the, from the name, from who they were working yeah. for, they didn't have the toolkit to like do the job. And yeah. so, you know, that was that was also why it was like, yeah, going to Washington Post, going to the Boston Globe was a kind of a lateral move, although it did put you on the radar of people yeah. like ESPN, mind their talent. You can go back and look at like yeah. my era and who they went after. Boston Globe, New York Times, Washington Post. That that was their yeah. feeder program. If you yeah. worked in one of those. Like yeah. you were in their sphere, you know, they saw yeah. the work that you were doing. So yeah. I think and, that's and, what happened and, to you. And the, I think going back to the beginning of my career too, like, I don't know if I told you this, but when I was in the seventh grade, I um, was at Sylvandale Junior High School in San Jose and we had a career day and a guy from the Warriors came and spoke to us. And I just went to go listen to him. He must have been dating one of our teachers or something. Because I'm like, why is this dude from the Warriors, like, driving down to San Jose to talk to us? And he was in, like, media relations or, P I don't know. But anyways, for some reason, he pointed at me and he asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I said, I want to play for y'all. And he's like, okay, I'm not going to tell you you can't. But if you can't, what are you going to do? And I was like, oh, no. And he said, well, my advice to you is if you can combine what you do best in school with what you love most in life, you can have a career that you'll be happy to go to every day. Amazing advice to give a seventh grader. Yeah. And at yeah. that time, I was I, I had a um, 
my dad blessed me with a um, Sports Illustrated, uh, you know, subscription. And I remember me, and this was in 84, Rick, reading a stat that said less than 2% of all college basketball players made it to the NBA. I was a pretty realistic kid. Yeah. And uh, my goal was to play college basketball. And if somehow I made it to the NBA, that'd be icing on the cake. I, I, I didn't really have NBA dreams because especially after I st- saw that stat. So I had that stat in my head, what the guy from the Warriors said to me. And I had this amazing teacher named Miss Thompson. Who ne- the next day she goes, all right, you got to write a letter to somebody in a field that you're interested in. So I wrote a letter to a guy by the name of Mark Purdy. Do you know the story? Uh, I, I, I know some of it. I've never heard it from yeah. you, but I've, yeah. I've read about it. So I, I, I sent Mark Purdy a letter, and he wrote me back telling me what to do from the seventh grade through college. He said, write the school paper or the school yearbook in junior high. When you get to high school, take all the typing classes that you can take. Get on the school yearbook or, or on the school paper. Um, when you get to college, take all the intern, get all the internships you can from the time you walk in the door, um, paid or unpaid. Um, he said, write on the school paper, uh, become a, a journalism major. Like I followed what he said, like a Bible. And I covered the eighth grade flag football team was my first job in the, when I was in the seventh grade. If you go back to the old Sylvandale papers, you'll see the sort of J in my Mark J Spears uh, in my byline was a seventh graders decision to put the J in there. And I just been rolling with it ever since. <laughs> That's good stuff. Right. But That's good stuff. I, when I went to when I went to I went to junior college first, I wrote on the the Sentinel at Foothill College. But I called sent I email I sent a letter to San Jose Metro asking them the weekly newspaper there if I could write sports stories for them for free for the summer. I just wanted clips. I wanted to get experience. And they said yes. And I wrote for an entire summer. I was the only one that did sports for them. They had Victor Chi was on there at the time too. I think he was doing music stuff. And he he remembers. And I was covering all these sports stories for them for the summer. And so I got clips. I had the Foothill Sentinel. I had uh, San Jose Metro. I became a member of the, San, uh, the National Association of Black Journalists. You know, uh, after my sophomore year, like I applied to like 30 internships and got turned down by everybody. The only one I got was from the National Association of Black Journalists who sent me to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Like I got the, the, the last straw right. out of everybody they picked. And I went to Grand Rapids, Michigan and, and interned at the Grand Rapids Press, which couldn't have been anything better. Like, because it was a smaller place, I got to cover a Cubs game. I got to cover a Detroit Lions event. I got to cover minor league baseball games. I got to cover, do a feature on a young boxer by the name of Floyd Mayweather Jr. when he was at the U.S. Olympic Festival. So now mm. my clips, Rick, getting pretty good. And I went to the first ever Unity Convention, which was Asian, Black, Indian, and um, uh, Hispanic Convention in Atlanta in in '94. And I or nine, it was like '93, '94. Wrote on the convention paper. Like my resume is getting good now. I'm in college. I end up meeting uh, a guy by the name of Bud Geraci. Bud ends up getting me some side work. Uh, taking football, high school football scores on Friday. Meanwhile, I'm playing college basketball. And then they got confidence in me and let me do be a stringer covering high school basketball games. My, my, my resume is getting better and better. And I'm writing for, I went to the University of District of Columbia for a year, then went to San Jose State. So I'm writing on the school paper. And then after I graduated, I had like, now I'm the dude. Like, I had offers from Washington Post, uh, LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle. And at that point in 95, the Dallas Morning News had the best sports page in the country, I believe. It was 75 pages long on Sunday. And my uncle, God rest his soul, uh, Joe Armand, he was like, you need to come here and intern there. And I did that for a summer. 
And to your point, Rick, I remember being there, great reporters, superstar reporters. I'm interning there in the summer. And I remember the sports editor there, the assistant sports editor there, man, made me cry. He put me in his room, office one day, and was talking about how bad my copy was and how much better I did. Bob Yates cursed me out, man. And I think it was some kind of like hazing thing he might have been doing too, kind of mess with me as an intern. And I, 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 I just teared up because I just wanted to be great so bad, and I felt like I disappointed him. And I think he was also like, I think he ended up feeling bad. Like, all right, this little hazing thing probably didn't go the way I wanted it to, but I just wanted to be great so bad. So like, and to be honest, my, my copy at that time needed a lot of work. So to your point, my first job, I went to the Tulsa world making 19,000 before taxes, but I got to cover Arkansas's football and basketball team. I got to cover the SEC. I was able to make mistakes and it wasn't the end of the world. Right. While Arkansas was the big beat, it was the lesser of the college beats there because it was in Oklahoma. It wasn't Oklahoma State. It wasn't the University of Tulsa in town. They just needed somebody to cover Arkansas. So I'm driving an hour and a half, but I'm covering Nolan Richardson. I'm covering the SEC. And I had a, a there was a copy editor by the name of Bob Carvin, who to this day, if Bob needed something, he could call me and it's done. He had one arm, I'm the only black kid in the newsroom, first black writer, I believe, at the Tulsa World. He took my raw copy, had me visit with him once a week, came to, to work early so he could help me become a better writer. He's like, look, he give me these papers, all this red ink on it. This is what you need to do to improve to the point where he didn't need to help me no more. Like, I owe that man a lot, you know, for taking his free time to help me out. But that's yeah. where going to the smaller place is great. Because if I was Agreed. making those errors at the Dallas Morning News, if I was making those errors at Sports Illustrated, ESPN, they would have fired me. And yeah. I've seen it happen to young journalists where they're in over their head. Yep. But I got to go to Tulsa, and it was okay for me to be young. They weren't paying me nothing. Right. You know, um, so they're like, oh, this is, we didn't invest much. Right. But they were using me and I used them and ended up getting into the next spot. But the good thing about starting small is one thing the young journalists got to remember, it doesn't last forever. These, these, these entry level jobs are like a year and a half, two years, maybe three. And then you go on to the next thing. But you can make a mistake and you can make a second mistake and you can make a third mistake. You know, grit their teeth a little bit. And some of the veterans might be a little mad. But if you were, they know that your heart is in the right place and you work hard and you want to get better. Yeah. By the time you're done in those two years, you'll you'll be your your work will be clean. You'll be ready. And Rick, they used to make me. I remember I used to have to cover Arkansas basketball road games at home. So I had to if it wasn't on TV, I would have to sit in my car outside the Tulsa World and listen to the game on the radio. Oh, my. And sit, and, I'd ha and I'm like, man, I could get robbed. <laughs> I'm sitting in the car on my, uh, listening to the game on the radio when it wasn't on TV with my Trash 80 computer, which people don't know what that is, but this is an old-school typewriter, which at the time yep. people thought it was state-of-the-art. Yep. And writing a game story. Did you have the flat one, or did you have the one that actually flipped up? I think at that time I had the flat one. I upgraded to the flip up at some yeah, point. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Then you were really I, then you then you had it going on when you when you didn't so, have that yeah. like little three oh, line yeah. screen the, on the tablet. Yeah. If anybody like I would buy one of those just to have it. It was a Tandy. Just, it was a Tandy. Yeah. T S eighty. You know, journalists don't was. know how bad we had it. But Woo! the people before us had typewriters, so but so I would have my trash 80 in my lap, writing a story in my car, in the dark, listening. And then I would like tape Nolan Richardson talk after the game. And then I'd go upstairs and wait for the facts to come with the quotes from, from the players and coaches and put this story together and send it in in, in quick fashion. 
So, shoot, I could write on their line with the best of them still to this day, man, after doing that exercise. No doubt. I, it, no doubt. <laughs> but no it was doubt. it was just me, man. Like, it it made me appreciate where I am now. Um, I, I remember I, had a, I was dating somebody at the time who get, bought me groceries or food stamps because she felt bad. You know, like, I, but I got through it and got that next yeah. job and then that next job. And, but it was that, that tough start that, but covering a high level, you know, school that ended up being the foundation to me yep. getting here. And I didn't, I didn't get the ESPN until like 21 years in the business. And some might say, because I went to undefeated, I went and, I went in an untraditional door to get into ESPN too, but I made it. Yep. And uh, I think I'm doing okay. But I, I, I tell all. I know this is a long story, Rick, but I tell all the young journalists, man, don't be afraid to go to Idaho to start your career. Don't be afraid to go to the small paper in New York that nobody yep. really reads, like. As long as you're getting experience, as long as you're able to make mistakes and it's not the end of the world, that's better than than probably going to the bigger name place. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. The the opportunity to have hands on experience to be doing what you want to do is invaluable. And I also, I, you know, going to San Diego or going to Tulsa, or going to wherever, like you're probably going to get paid about the same that you would in one of the big cities, and you're going to be able to live a little. <laughs> <laughs> a yeah. little easier, man. A, it, my money was tight, but I actually had a half decent apartment in Tulsa. Man. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Up. Your money goes a little bit longer in those small places, man. And so I'm, I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for that. I, I support that 100. percent You, um, I'm. What I'm really interested in now is you have one. You've diversified, like you, you've produced, right? Um, you, you got a, 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 an added degree at, uh, LSU, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and Sometimes. so, and yeah, and yet you still, you, you're still working in the business. And, and I, well, I think the, the most interesting thing for me is like, you're still reporting or, or at least on some level breaking news here and there. And what I've found is like it's hard to do that today unless you're consumed by that one thing. How have you managed to kind of balance all these juggle all these balls and diversify and still yeah. and still do some meaningful journalism for for ESPN? Well, you know when I when I got to Yahoo and I was there um Obviously, breaking news is very, very popular. You were you you were really good at it when you wanted to be good at it. I think when I was focused on mostly doing that, I was really, really good at it. Goddamn, Woj is a monster at it. Yeah, <laughs> he's like <laughs> he, he's a monster at it, and and Shams has gotten to be pretty good at it. And there's, yep. there's some others like Chris Ains who breaks some stuff. And Rick, man, I I'll be completely honest with you, man. I hated that, like mm. being a part of my like main focus. And I felt like, and this is certainly what I'll do respect to the newsbreakers because there's an art to it. I just felt like for me, I needed a different challenge. Yep. I need, I wanted a challenge that wasn't like, I, I remember the low, the high I would feel when I broke a story and the low that I would feel and you know how it feels when you've been chasing something and and that agent gives it to somebody else you know oh, you're just crushed and i and i hated that and i wanted to do something different in my lane that i thought could be not only impactful immediately but have lasting impact so when the job opened up at the undefeated man i wanted it bad like i, I, I really really wanted it bad i wanted to be there I wanted, I, I grew up in a household that, you know, my mom didn't get that, didn't get to go to a nursing school in New Orleans because she was black. My dad won a racism lawsuit in the early 1990s from New United Motors in Fremont 
with a collection of other black people who would train white people and then they'd be promoted over them. Um, my mom used to take me to the San Jose Afro-American Center as a kid, and I would be watching Eyes on the Prize when I was 10 years old. So I was seeing, you know, mm. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, you know, uh, white fountain, black fountain, dog sicking black people, water hoses, Alabama, like all that. Imagine watching that as a 10 year old. And I mm. actually, even in growing mm. up in San Jose, as multicultural as it was, the racism I dealt with from, to be honest, people of um, Asian and uh, Mexican descent growing up is, is something that I will never forget. But I don't, a lot of times people hold racism against people that have been racist against them. But that was that individual. That wasn't that race. So I'd never hold that against a whole race. Like people hold that against, you know, oh, this black person robbed me. So all black people ain't shit. No, that's, that's some stupid shit. That person ain't shit. And I think that's the problem with racism today is a lot of times people are maybe fearful of one person and they make that like that, like you can't paint a whole brush of people that way. There's a lot of white people that have helped me. <laughs> like, so yeah. in my yeah. career, they weren't racist. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't racist white people, but that'd be idiotic for me to paint all white people as racist because of some assholes. Right. Yeah. I don't know if no, I can curse on this, but um, yeah, uh, but anyway, I, I, I anticipated, my, so I, I I tagged this as potential course language, so we're good. I'm sorry, we're good. yeah. But anyways, but my point is like, I kind of yearn to stay in the basketball lane because I love who. Yeah. My connections now span since '99. I just know too many people. It, it's too late for me to switch to the NFL or another sport, right? It's too late. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And it would be stupid. Too. Yeah. But I, yeah. I was like, but what could I do that's different? And so to write about what I'm writing today about with the undefeated is the greatest godsend I could ever have. Yeah. I, I forever thank Kevin Merida for giving me this opportunity because now I'm writing about race and culture in the NBA. It's, 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 it's so mentally exhilarating to me like every day trying to cover like and you would think that it, it, at some point you'd run out of stuff to write about but it just racism is a gift that keeps on giving <laughs> like you know what i mean <laughs> and well and just, there's, especially there's how it features yeah especially how it's no, evolving ahead. now because it's become yeah. a it's become a a bigger element in our sports conversation than it ever has yeah. before because we've got athletes who are engaging in it and and I think we are in a place in society where we're now you know being forced to take a hard look at stories and situations the Tulsa massacre as an example yeah. like I just found I, I find it extraordinary and I didn't wasn't aware of that story until not that long ago right and the fact yeah. that that wouldn't be part of our history books is ex uh, I mean, it gives you just a glimpse of how whitewashed our yeah. our history is, how it's been presented. Our history is presented by the people who write it, and and can skew the reality. And so I I understand that. I the 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 challenge that I have. I it's funny to hear you talk about being a newsbreaker and not really embracing that i like that's not where i started either i didn't start out to be a newsbreaker and but being on an espn platform and because of all the contacts that i developed in telling stories about the nba there was just stuff that came to me right yeah and it's it yeah. so there's something that you said that is the exact reason why um being a newsbreaker in today's game is not appealing to me and it's and you said it's because an agent gave it to somebody else first like yeah. that's what it's become it's become yeah. where am i on the pecking order of yeah. these people 
that have the information and how do I maintain that relationship so that I'm first? And, and that's not what it used to be. It used to be like, if I'm doing my work, I'm going to find out some things that I now follow that road and if I, and I can get to it first. Now it's not like that. It's a matter of yeah. no, I, if like, you tell me what agent, I could tell you who get it. Exactly. Exactly. Say, and you that, know, if you tell me the player, but again, I will say this. Woj is a mastermind. I work yes. with him. Yes. The way he works the phones, his connections, his 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 uh octopus arms to different people. Yep. Like he built this into a science that yes, he nobody did. else will ever compete with until the day he stops wanting to do it. Yep. You no, know, exactly. There are others right. that have gotten pretty good with it, and every, every now and then I'll sneak dunk you. Now I yep. still sneak dunk you. I, yep. I have yep. something every now and then, yep. you know, uh, because of what you said, because of the people we know. And sometimes when you have, and Rick, you you had, you were one of the guys that definitely had great relationships with players. If if a player loved you, he'd give you stuff. Now, yeah, and, but in a different sense, I think I do that with feature stories. Right. So I had today that George Hill gave me an exclusive interview about how he went and visited the site of the Tulsa race massacre by himself. That that was something that he knew he was going to get traded from the Thunder. And before he left Oklahoma, he was on a mission to go there. He asked his teammates if he wanted to. They wanted to come. Nobody wanted to come. OK, hmm. I'm going to drive down there by myself. Take the two hour drive to, to Tulsa and he spent seven hours by himself visiting different places. Um, so to me, that's how I try to break news now. It, it's yeah. with talking to Jason Kidd, who I know you love, um, about his hopes of getting becoming a head coach again. Like, so to me, there's different ways to break news. Um, yeah. there's ways to break news with quotes and experiences. And it isn't just 10 day contracts or trades or rumors or who got fired as coach. There's so I, I think I do it in a different way now, but it's also in a way that I love and enjoy because I just. And you're, you're like this, too. You, you're a people person, man. I love talking to people. I can't just sit in a room and just call people all day. Nah, man, I got to I want to I want to go have lunch with you like. One of my favorite interviews I always like because I'm loving watching him now. I got to go interview Julius Randall once when he was with New Orleans. His agent calls me and he says, hey, Julius doesn't want you to interview him after the game or doesn't want in in you to interview him after practice. He wants you to come to his house. He wants you to come to his house and have dinner with him and his family and get to know him. Brilliant by Julius Randall. Yeah, brilliant that he had the foresight to be like, all right, this dude's going to write a feature on me in Undefeated, which will be on the ESPN. And I'm trying to make a name for myself. I guess he's good, a pretty well-known reporter. I'm going to build a relationship with him. My agent loves this guy. Come to the house. Yep. Yep. And, yep. and so that like, that's what right right now is killing me because we have to do mostly everything on the phone. And I'm thinking See, about like what I'm yeah. missing on, like yeah. going on Zoom, like maybe maybe at the world, when the world was better, I would have went with George Hill on that tour. Yeah, He told me that yes. and like, hey, Mark, I'm going in two days. Call my people. Yeah. Maybe even bring a camera with me, you know. Yep. Yep. But that that's what I miss right now. But slowly that's coming back. and. um I, I I just love telling stories, and it's amazing that I could write, Rick, I know I'm rambling on, but that I could write a story and it could come back. Like it has legs. It, it's ref I wanted my stories to be reference material, yep. which I love because now Kyrie Irving says something about Boston and the race issues between the players in Boston. Well, two years ago, I wrote a story that I worked on for two years about what it's like to be black playing for the Celtics. So it's funny now that all these people are referring to that story in writing about Kyrie and Danny Ainge scoffing against it. They're showing examples from my story. Then 
Pete Morant, John Morant's dad, like some fan says some racist stuff to him at a game. I wrote about what it's like to be black playing for the Jazz. <laughs> like, so now people are like reading that story. So it's it's beautiful to me that I could write stories now that almost could be like some good record. Where you're like, man, I want to hear yep. that song. Yep. Or I I need I need to listen to that. I need to listen to that because that can explain why so and so feels this way. And even like that Julius Randall story, people doing some research on him, they could read that and learn about him before he became this Knicks All Star. Yeah. So I, no, I, I I love what I do. Um, I think Kevin Merida, who's now leaving to the LA Times, and for for I told I tell him he saved my career because I mentally just chasing news. Just couldn't do it, man. Like yeah. I, I could, that couldn't be my lifeline, you know. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing too is, you know, for me when when I when I pivoted when I left, like I left ESPN. It was they were offering me another deal, but it was my kids were five and seven, yeah. and I was going to have I was either back in Bristol or I was on the road. Um, it was. I just I I knew I wasn't going to see my kids grow up. I knew I had to do something different. Yeah. And so I took that leap of faith. And and that's the other part to be like I don't know how Woj does it cuz I know he's married and has a family or last I knew he was married and had a family. <laughs> like oh, God I, I don't, bless his wife, boy. She gets it. Woo! Like he gets it. She Amy, I, yeah. shout out to Amy. Amy gets it. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I was at a point in my life where I could not do it that way. Um, yeah. you know, Shams is at a life, he's at a place in his life where I was when I came in. Like, I didn't mind devoting but, 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 my but life Rick, to the job. But, but, but Rick, but Rick, it's like us liking different music or different food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, what what they're what they're in love with and what they get a high off of is different than what yeah. we get a high off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because very cause true. I think that again, like we love. Some people don't really like being in the locker room. Some people don't. So if you're at, you could be at home and be breaking all those stories if you you make the right phone calls and you you don't have to go right. anywhere. Like, what well, yes, so connected true. now? I I think. People want to give him stuff. And, shoot, I get it. Like, he's got, like, two million. If I was somebody breaking some news, I'd give it to him, too. He got over two million followers. Well, that, yeah. No, that, that's. And, and, that, that, and, and it yeah. promotes your client. So I, I get it. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but that, for me, my high is interaction with people, sitting with them. Getting a story, like, tell, I love storytelling and telling people a story they don't know. Yeah. So, like, 100%. Being able to make somebody feel like somebody told me I went to the Hall of Fame and our access was, wasn't the greatest, but they told me that based on the story that I wrote about the Hall of Fame and Vanessa Bryant, that they felt like they were there with her. No and higher that, compliment. No, that 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 certainly made all the work I did to write that story. That made me feel good. Yeah. How so? Um, when it comes to the the pandemic, as you as you said, like I'm looking around and I'm looking for stories. I I I took note of the fact that we haven't seen any meaningful in depth stories this year for the most part. Um, I mean. You and the George Hill thing is is an example is an exception rather than the rule. Like ha we haven't seen yeah. any like deep profiles like the one you talked about yeah. with with getting together with Julius Randle because of this. How much and you and I know that seeing people in person at games yeah. for the stories that we want to write is vital to being around people and seeing. You can't do those by phone. No. Um, even one-on-ones, they're not, it's not the same. No. How much no. has, how much is this separate, everything by Zoom, everything at arm's length, every everything in group settings, 
Like if I were still like writing feature stories and doing all, basically doing what you're doing, I would, I feel like, I don't know, anxious or feel like, I, I I don't have the connective tissue that I yeah. need to do my no. story, my to do to do my job. How are you? Yeah. How are you managing that? I'm I'm tired of the NBA at this point, man. Because, and I and I'm not saying something they don't know because they I've expressed this to certain people. The fact that they allow people to sit courtside now, but I can't go talk to a player from a distance else after the game is like, like it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And I, I think that the teams and the league are taking advantage of the media and that, 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 that at this, I, I keep hearing it's about to loosen up. It's about to loosen up. Like, why are we waiting for it to loosen up? Yeah. I was in the NBA bubble. We didn't go to the locker room in the NBA bubble. I get it. But after the game, the players were at a dip. And if you had a relationship with the guy, you could stretch your arm out and talk to him like, you know, like that right. and get what you need, get, get maybe some little one-on-one -on -one stuff. And it worked fine. And um, like I'm vaccinated. I would think that most of the writers are vaccinated. If you want to vaccinate, you can check my vaccination card and make me take a, a COVID test, I'll do it in yep. order to like get access to these guys. And so I, I heard a, a PR guy who I'll name nameless from NBA said, man, we're not getting no feature stories anymore. Nobody's, he's like, you know, when we would travel around, I know if I'm in the Bay, I'm going to see you. And Sam Amick and Chris Haynes, like I'm gonna see some national guys, and uh, amongst that, you guys might do uh, pick up a couple feature stories on my team. And, and you know this, Rick. Like we would get different stories on different players. You may not write it that day, but you collect them like a squirrel getting nuts, you know, and save yep. them, yep. and then pop them when you pop them. Whereas now, like maybe you could get guys on the phone. And like when you, I see the situation, like with Kyrie, like Kyrie's not doing any zooms, but there are some media, and I like to say I'm one of them, who if he sees me, will be like, yeah, I'll talk to Mark. You know, I I I I'll talk to him. You know, I I'll give uh, yeah, I'll, I, and but I you can't do that over the phone, man, and so. It's interesting that they're going to loosen it up now when they're trying to get the most publicity for their league, right? During the most uh, high profile time. But not only do I feel bad for the, for us as journalists, but I do feel bad for a lot of even like the small market teams where teams got to realize when you, when you get high on the hog, when you get great, you forget that we are free publicity. We are free advertising. Yes. Well, and, and not only that, but we, and not to, this sounds self-serving, but the reality is there's an authenticity to having a third party validate who your player is, not just as a player, but as a person. Like, yeah. make people care about that player from a personal standpoint, not just what their scoring average is. Yeah. And it's one thing for the player to put something out like that, or the team to put something out like that. But when it comes from a third entity, even if it's yeah. a broadcast partner, yeah. it, it, it just has an authenticity that, and a validity that you don't get when it's self produced. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's what they're, that's what they're missing. That's what today's yeah. owners with their venture capitalist mindset are missing is that they just see the real estate within an arena and they see the streamlining the access and they're like, let's just get the most money out of the fans and put them as close as possible. Let's sell yeah. that access because that's yeah. real dollars. How do I put a dollar on that feature story, that, that access that I'm giving? Yeah. 
And it's hard. You can't put that on a spreadsheet. But I think that the the thing, I don't know about you, but the thing that attracted me to the NBA was because I could touch the soul of the game. Because the players felt that accessible. Because I read stories yeah. about them that made me feel like I knew them. And that's yeah. why I wanted to cover the NBA more than I wanted to cover baseball or football or whatever. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, I could feel that, right? Yeah. And I and I feel as if they're they're losing that, and now yeah. the players, like as you said, you know, like we don't really know who Kyrie is, and I don't know that his, I don't even know that his story has been aptly presented. So then it becomes yeah. easy to not like a dude because he says one thing that makes a headline, yeah. and you don't really get the whole. I saw Derrick Rose go through this, like. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and I and I know, like I knew Derek, so I was like, yeah. I'd spend oh, a bit of spend time pie. with him. What's that? Sweetest pie. Yeah, sweetest yeah, pie. and 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 like, and it's all about the right things. But people yeah. will get one, like yeah. one, one blurb, and then everybody would say that's who he is. Yeah. And and I feel like that's where the NBA is underserving its players now, and even the players oh, don't really? realize like. You, you got to allow I'll, I'll people to get to know you. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Had I been at the – had I had access and been traveling and I went to that Denver game last night, I've known Austin Rivers since he was in high school, junior high, when he used to be around the Celtics every day because his dad was there and how he used to be at practice and not really bother anybody, just kind of watch and listen. and ended up getting a work ethic like Im imagine being a high school kid and you get to watch kevin garnett work out and paul pierce work out and ray allen work out behind the scenes and see what they do to 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 become special and i could if i could have if i would have been in that locker room austin would have gave me all the time in the world and I could have had this amazing feature about Austin Rivers and his mind and not having a job for two months and all, all that kind yep. of stuff. And I could probably call yep. Austin right now and not not flexing or nothing, but and get that. But the moment is has left, right? Like, I mean, I guess I could write something and it could, but it ain't like being there and seeing his emotion and outs after the game yes. and looking him in the eye and. Like, I, I always, like, one of my favorite interviews, P.J. Tucker had the game of his life in one of those Warriors playoff games. And he ended up getting stitches after the game, talked to the media, and I was able to get him on my own after all that. And I had never really talked to him at that point. And he talked to me for 20 minutes, like, wait while his family waited on him. And he and I, I got to write a, an amazing feature about who is P.J. Tucker, right? Like, I can't do that over Zoom. Like, that it, it for, for, to me, the whole Zoom culture is helpful to the, the, the writer that's either young in tooth or isn't that good or is lazy. It saves them. But for people yeah. that, like, go in the locker room and actually talk to the guys and and get some personal insight it's this is like cut i keep saying it's cutting my legs out from me yeah no 100 percent, 100 percent. um before i let you go tell me I'm, I'm 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 interested you you did the spencer haywood rule book yeah and i think you did it in conjunction with gary washburn yes how how did that because i've behind the scenes i've kind of heard how you guys did that um uh but tell me how did how did you how did you guys go about writing that book and 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 what what was the process in getting that done okay here's the truth Spencer haywood is amazing one is one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. I call him the Black Forest Gump. His story is amazing. Is yeah. unbelievable. I, look, I read the book. From, yeah, from beginning to end, it's just like 
you just feel like you're sitting there and people are just telling you crazy stories about their life. It's like sitting with Forrest Gump at the bus stop, right? Yeah. But and what to be honest, this book didn't pay as much, right? And books, as you know, Rick, are extremely hard to do. That being said, as a black journalist, I've never in my career have been offered an opportunity to do a book. Bill Duffy, who's a dear friend of both of ours, yep. um, super agent, uh, he asked Spencer, you know, what writers are you comfortable with? What, 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 what writers do you like? And he's like, man, you know, Mark Spears wrote this story on me when he's, you know, with the Undefeated that I really enjoyed doing an interview with him. And I love the story that he wrote about me and how he actually cared to know about how I grew up and picked cotton as a kid and took me back to Mississippi and all that. I would love for him to write. So uh, I instantly wanted to do the book. I don't have a lot of free time. And it wasn't paying a lot. And my, my agent, Mark Carmody, kind of warned me, like, Mark, this is a, gonna be kind of a labor of love thing because you're not gonna get paid too much of it. But I can finally have a book under my belt. And then when something more financially greater comes, nobody can say I haven't written a book before because I have. Right. Yeah. That being said, I didn't really have the time to do it. And I'd known Gary Washburn for a long time. We worked at the LA Daily News together in the late 90s. We're very good friends and love him. And we were talking one day and I was telling him about the challenge of trying to like write this book by myself in an off season, not knowing that I could do it. And he's like, man, I would, I'd love to have an opportunity to write a book, man. No one's ever offered me the opportunity to write a book either. And I was like, aha. Aha! Uh -huh. Like the it being a labor of love. Like, hey Gary, let's split the money, man. Why don't we just split the book? Split the money, yeah. and that's how that Got all it. came about. Which took a lot of pressure off of me, and he was excited about it. Spencer trusted me, and 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 now is tight with Gary, and we we both basically I did the book from birth to through Olympics, and then Gary did the rest. And okay. um, so that's how I ended up enlisting Gary in it because I was nervous that I didn't have the time to do the whole thing by myself. Got it. Because Got I, it. I do Got write it. so much for the for the undefeated, and um, yep. I, I I when and you know how it is, Rick. Once the off season starts, you want to disappear. Yep. Last thing you yep. want to do is write, right? So. Yep. What I was writing was manageable, and I'm one of people like once I get started, let's go, and then I'll get it done and move on, right? Yep. And so Gary was. I, I ended up interviewing Spencer, summer league, 2019, for like three, over the course of three days. I think I interviewed him like 12 hours. Yeah. Had one of my cousins, Cameron Hay, young budding, budding star journalist, got him like 500 bucks from the company to like transcribe everything to make sure it was correct. Cause I trusted him and was able to get my first book done, but you can you see go. the thing in the back. There you go. So, got but it. no, nah, I, I couldn't turn it down because I'd never had one to turn down. Yep. And I wanted to get it done. So. In the terms of diversifying myself, I've, I've done a documentary. I've done a book. I've done a lot of different things like hosting the Hall of Fame, which I'll never forget that. Um, and, um, I got this TV project on, that I'm hopefully I could talk to, have something to talk about in a couple months and you can bring me back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, like you, man, you, I can't just eat the same bread all the time, man. And I get, I, I want, I need to do different projects. That's why I got my master's from LSU as well in sports business management. Cause at some point, man, they might tap me on my shoulder, but I want to be ready. Yeah. If that happens, cause that's nothing, nothing's forever. Yep.
No, agreed. And I there is there is a number of things that we weren't able to go get get to that I that I'd like to. So I'd very much love to have you back in a couple months when you can talk about the TV project. We can get a little more into the sports business management uh, degree, uh, the documentary. Um, you know, going back to New Orleans, I'm sure that that was a that was that was also a passion project for you in doing that. Oh, um, very much so. Yeah. And so, yeah. This is what I made no, out. <laughs> so we will, we will do, we we will, we will return to all of that in the next couple of months. But we're 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 full up now. And uh, Mark, as always, a pleasure, man. This uh, this isn't like uh, being able to get together in person, but it's the next best thing. I'm glad we got a chance yes, to chop it up. Um, I'm very, yeah, let me, very let happy me know when for we're you get, that uh, things are rolling. Get, get one of those beach drinks, man. Like, go sit by the yeah. ocean and have, have a cold one, man. Let me know. I'm around. Brother, you got it. We'll do it. All right, man. All right, man. Peace. Thank you very much. No, Talk man, to you later. My pleasure, man. All right. You got it.